Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, the state treasurer criticizes the governor's idea to use more trust land money to fund education. And State Senator Kelly Ward will take on John McCain in the GOP primary for the U.S. Senate. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Mary Jo Pitzel of the Arizona Republic, Bob Christie of the Associated Press, and Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times. State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt comes out against Governor Ducey's plans to increase the payout of state trust land money for education. Uh, there are so many ways to start the conversation, but this is first sign of life from the new treasurer, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's been pretty quiet, um, and he, as treasurer, he is the he's the steward of the state permanent endowment land trust, and he's crunched the numbers, looked at the got the same numbers that the governor used, and did his analysis and said this is going to erode the trust. Um, in the long run, this is not a good idea. This is not sustainable. Emailed that, uh, emailed his ideas to all 90 lawmakers. Correct. That's correct, and uh, it uh, <laughs> it hit pretty quickly. And it was uh, it was a decent analysis. I mean, basically, the governor's plan is let's spend about two billion dollars of the 5.1 billion dollar state trust land. Most of it in the first five years. Some of the next five years. We'll end up with about the same amount of money as we have now when we're done. But the schools will have had. Uh, five years of a lot of extra money and five years of a little bit more money. What the treasurer did is looked at that and said, okay, you're going to spend $2 billion to give $2 billion to schools over 10 years. Over the next 40 years, they're going to lose $8 billion in revenue. Um, he says it's just a bad plan. Well, and where he pointed out that he picked up where Ducey's analysis left off and showed us the, with a lovely graph, the fiscal cliff that's created when um, the Ducey plan uh, expires because the governor believes right. in sunsets and it, his would end after 10 years. And when a sales tax that voters approved back in 2000 also expires, so that's a big drop off in money for education and sort of begs the question of then what next? Yeah, the bigger problem is, you know, right before the, or, you know, the first half of this plan, which is where most of the money is coming from, right before that, ex that ends is you have this Prop 301 sales tax increase that uh, voters approved, I believe, in 2000 ends. And that's actually the bigger part of this fiscal cliff. And that leaves you, you know, like Mary just said, the big question of what do you do then? You know, are you going to raise, are the state going to find a billion dollars more for schools in its general fund? More likely what you're going to see is people are going to try and re-up this uh, Prop 301 tax, but you almost got to wonder, is Ducey setting the stage for people to try and push for another tax hike to replace this trust fund money? Because these schools aren't going to want to lose, and even if they get the 301 money back, they're not going to want to lose 350, 400 million just in one fell swoop. So you've got the, the lesser percentage there uh, as far as the Ducey plan <coughs> is concerned, combined with perhaps the loss of this 301. You're talking maybe a billion dollar hit there. That's one argument. The other argument that DeWitt makes, and, and it's one that the treasurer needs to look at, is this isn't necessarily healthy for the fund. No, it's not healthy. I mean, you think about your 401k. When you retire at age 65 or 67 and you start taking money out of your 401k, you're not supposed to take out 5% or 10% a year out of your 401k for five years because then what happens in the out years is that your income is greatly reduced. You're not supposed to spend the principal. And that's what the governor's doing. For a short-term fix, he's saying, we need the money for the schools. I'm against tax increases, so let's look at our 401k balance. And that's the important part of the, the treasurer's critique is, that, is what it does to the, to the fund. I mean, you know, the, the loss of the Prop 301 money is sort of just might, you know, deepen the hole for mm -hmm. schools, if you would, or, or less than how much money they get. But his concern is what this does to the, the corpus of the, of the trust, you know, in the out years, because, you know, this set, this is a permanent trust. It does not expire. It is to last forever. And if you cut this deeply into it, I've heard it described to lawmakers as this is a, a snowball of, you know, accumulating interest and, you know, it's and as the snowball goes down the hill, it right. picks up a lot right. of steam and therefore more money. No, but no. this plan, I'm sorry, but this plan <laughs> stops it, cuts it in half, and then starts to push it back up the hill so that when it's allowed to start rolling down again, it's much smaller. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the long-term health of fund, uh, Treasurer DeWitt's uh, concerns on that, Governor Ducey's response has basically been, well, the schools need the money now. Yeah. And they've argued that, well, you know, based on, you know, forecast, there, there'll still be more money in it, you know, by the time this plan ends than uh, there is now. Now, he 
hasn't really had much of a response to the fiscal cliff issue. In fact, as the governor's office put out a uh, memo to lawmakers more or less in response to do its criticism, and they address some of the more minor issues and a little bit on the long-term health stuff, but really no mention of the fiscal cliff. They mentioned that Prop 301 will expire in calendar year 2020 and say, well, it'll be up to the voter and the legislature if they want to decide whether to, you know, Renew that, but mm -hmm. that's yeah, really the only addressing that. There. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and Governor Ducey, you know, you know, obviously not a big fan of taxes. So you got to wonder which way he'll go on that when when the time comes. Right, and it's just, it's office. a short term fix. There's no long term solution here, and that's I think troubling to Dewitt because Dewitt's looking at he's supposed to to uh, make sure the land trust spins off 50, 100, 150, 200 million dollars a year in perpetuity, not get a bunch now and then lower later. And it doesn't fix the schools long term. And then I think that it, what surprised me is it took so long for somebody to really look at it and come out and say, you know, this this is not a really a good plan. And yet we hear uh, a couple of previous state treasurers also now joining in, saying that, that with Dean Martin, Carol Spring are both saying that they don't like this idea either. Correct. You know, I mean, they've been in the same seat as as Dewitt, and actually the same seat as mm -hmm. Ducey. Um, who was treasurer before being elected governor? So you have, um, I don't know, three against one for whatever that's worth. But you know, Ducey's analysis is that the fund will be okay. That that relies, um, you know, on uh, putting putting a lot of stock in um, an ever-growing stock market and your stock investments. I think it was six and a quarter percent increase is what he's counting on six to make and, sure it's six and three quarters. Six and three and quarters. The treasurer pointed out that he doesn't uh, factor in any down years. Yeah. So as we all know, those you know you might have a six or an eight or a ten percent year, but you might have a ten percent loss in a year. And according to the treasurer, eight billion dollar hits over forty years, and he, he takes it up to twenty one twelve and says it's one hundred and seventy five billion if you go that far. Well, that you know that's, no, that's it's kind of difficult, out. yeah, to, to put into the the brain here. But is this getting traction? This criticism? I, I think very much so. I mean, we've already seen uh, Democrats really railing against this plan for you know some of the same reasons. Now you've got to wonder: Is this going to bring some Republican opposition once he puts this before the legislature? Because they're the ones you're going to have to refer this to the ballot. And, you know, if you start peeling off Republicans, you only need to take away two in the uh, Senate before, you, you know, presuming the Democrats go against it, which I think is probably highly questionable. But, you know, if the governor needs Democratic votes all of a sudden, do they get leverage? What are they going to want out of this? You know, it becomes kind of a mess. You know, this could be his Medicaid expansion for all we know. Well, but the alternative is the schools don't get the money. So well, then what? I don't know if that's the alternative or not. The alternative to this is a tax increase. Well, okay. which, the, which you know, we you cannot just say that that's not the alternative. You could say the governor will not do it and the legislature won't do it, but it is an alternative. Well, it's an alternative. It's not right. viable. So that's I right. mean, so let's talk uh, about viable alternatives. Well, what think, happens? I think what you got to keep in mind is that it's July. Um, the legislature doesn't come back to work until January. There's plenty of time to work on language. You know, the governor hasn't put together, or at least hasn't publicly released any specific language on how this whole measure would be crafted. Um, so, you know, maybe he would talk to DeWitt or, you know, incorporate some of DeWitt's ideas. I mean, you've, you've, got, you, you've got it out there, you know, in, in the public discussion. Right. And There's months before you're going to be seeing a bill drafted. And DeWitt did say, you know, a better plan is to sell off some more trust lands, beef up the permanent trust cash balance, and then your your interest off that will be higher. So, but, that, but that's uh, you know that's one thing that the governor's office did address in this memo is calling that you know very unrealistic. They're saying that to meet you know to to get the same amount of money out of increased land sales, you have to increase that you know you have to sell you know eighteen and a half billion dollars more land over that decade. I think, and the problem with that is the land sales. You know you can't just put up as well, someone put it to us. You can't just put out a for sale sign. This follows market trends. You know market forces. You know. They sell land when people want to buy the land. It's kind of hard to say we're just going to ramp this up and you know make it happen. Shaping up to be a major issue next session. Oh, most definitely. I mean, this will be a major issue. But don't forget, we also the, the governor's plan doesn't address anything for the next year, the, ne the coming year for schools. Mm -hmm. And we still have we still have the famous lawsuit that's out right. there and the you know the negotiations going on with the three judge panel. Well, that's interesting. Are you sensing among lawmakers that you talk to maybe a, a shift in attitude toward education? funding? Are we starting to hear folks that were dead set against tax increases or additional funding in the whole nine yards saying, uh, the governor's saying the schools need more money? I think everybody says, it, the vast majority of lawmakers that I talk to all agree that the schools have need more money. That, that, and as we've seen in the last few months, it's a major issue with, with the public. Um, the solution is, the, is, of course, the tough thing. 
I mean, do you raise taxes? That's, uh, as we've talked about, not likely. Do, you know, this is a plan. And that's the governor's hope, I think, is that here's the money. I can get you the money yeah. and not raise taxes. All right, let's move on here. Uh, Jeremy, uh, Kelly Ward has announced that she will now take on Senator John McCain, waited till uh, Donald Trump left town, and, and everyone was very excited about that aspect. Uh, talk to us about this. Well, Kelly Ward's a state senator from uh, Lake Havasu City. She's uh, been flirting with this race for a while. Everyone figured McCain is going to get some sort of challenge from the right, just like he did in 2010 with Hayworth. Now, whether or not this is going to be as formidable a challenge, you know, remains to be seen. That, you know, in her announcement speech, which was up in Lake Havasu, not in Phoenix, interestingly enough, but uh, you know, she called it a David and Goliath race and said, "Well, remember, you know, David won that one." But I'm not hearing that same optimism among uh, you know most political observers. She's very unknown. She's she's made a reputation at the Capitol, I think, as a pretty serious lawmaker, someone who carries she's carried some major bills. But to the general public, very unknown, They're hearing a lot of skepticism about her fundraising ability and simply coming at McCain from the right. You know, he's had these challenges before, and, you know, Hayworth, he beat him by almost 25 points. Uh, the impact of organizing a forum on chemtrails. <laughs> this happened last summer, and Senator Ward facilitated, made this happen, she said, because she had a lot of constituents who were very concerned about these contrails that, are, um, that streak across the sky that um, are widely believed to come from planes and just be exhaust. Um, but there is, there's a whole school of thought that, no, these are chemicals that somebody, the government, is dispersing on, uh, on the public. So Senator War got um, two staffers from the State Department of Environmental Quality to come out to her district and hold a forum. And she maintains she's agnostic on the issue, but um, her name is going to be forever linked to chemtrails. Impact of going to the Clive and Bundy Ranch and showing support. Uh, another issue that will likely uh, affect Ward's candidacy, I think. Um, you know, sh this goes along with a lot of stuff that she's done. She's from the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party. Um, she's pushed a lot of stuff that are federal pushback, that are don't trust the federal government, which are don't trust the NSA. Um, you know, don't let federal people go in unless they check in with the sheriff. All these laws she signed on to, these proposed laws, which haven't made it through. I think between the Clive and Bundy issue, where she went up there and basically cheered him on as he pushed back against the federal government, and the chemtrails things, there's plenty of ammunition for any good candidate's committee to, uh, to attack her. And we've also got defending Donald Sterling, the uh, LA Clippers former owner, his right to say what he said, which was not good. Yeah, she said she was very concerned about you know, what she viewed as an infringement on his free speech rights. And you know, to be clear, she did not defend his actual the, ra the actual racist comments that got him, you know, banned from the NBA. But she did, uh, you know, for someone who's in a run for statewide office, you know, it's probably not a statement you want to have on the records, to, you know, kind of defending Don Donald Sterling in any way. But, you know, McCain and his allies are already having a field day with this stuff. Remember five years ago, you know, McCain was very successful at painting Hayworth as an extremist who shouldn't be taken seriously, and he's got very quickly got to work doing the same thing to Ward, and he's even gotten a little bit help from people you would expect to help Ward. You know, the, some of the national groups are already saying, or hinting, they're not going to do much to help her. One said, one told, I believe it was Politico a few months ago, you know, you know, can, you know we can't really spend money for her. They're going to call her Chemtrail Kelly, and, you know, making there up, you, you, know, yeah. you probably don't want your allies making up nicknames for your opponent. So th does a Matt Salmon look at this and say, she can blaze the trail and I'll come in a little bit later on and pick up some steam here? What, what do you think? Mm, I don't think that we're going to see a big name in this race. I mean, it's possible Salmon could get in. It's possible Swiker could get in. That's the type of name you'd really need to knock off John McCain. But what's the upside for, for yeah. Schweiker? What's the upside for, for them? You know, because... They're in, they're in solid co congressional seats. They're not going to lose. Right. Um, I was just going to say, and especially with the Supreme Court ruling um, of earlier this or last month that, you know, basically says leaves the congressional map intact. You know, both Schweikert and Salmon have very secure sure districts. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Jobs and, for life. And Schweikert's pretty much ruled himself out already. Salmon still hasn't really made a you know, final statement on what he's going to do, but it seems like the general consensus more and more is that he's just not going to take that plunge. What about Ken Bennett deciding to get into the congressional district one race? Well, he said he'd been thinking about it for a while. I mean, actually, you know, Ken, Ken Ben has been thinking about running up in rural Arizona, you know, years, years back. Um, and then things intervened. You know, he was tapped to become Secretary of State and, and served as Secretary of State. Um, and most recently, he was weighing whether to run there or run in District 9, a, a 
potentially taking on Kirsten Cinema in the in the greater Phoenix area. Um, interestingly, neither he doesn't live in either. Well, he does live in, in District Nine currently, um, but does not live in, in CD One. But says, look, I've got a lot of rural ties. He's lived in Prescott most of his life. Um, but Prescott isn't in CD1, <laughs> um, but he would, but, but it's close. And it, and it reflects the, the rural nature of that big congressional district. Yeah, yeah he, did not, he did not do well in the, the Republican governor's primary. No, he, he did not do well at all. So w how much of an impact is that? How much political weight does Ken Bennett have these days? Well, I don't think he has a huge amount. I mean, you have to understand CD1 is a big sprawling district. I mean, he, he has some upside in that he's from the northern Arizona, or as Andy Tolan would say, I can see the district from my back porch. <laughs> um, uh, and so he's been up in the area. He knows the players. He can, he's worked that hard. That's the part of the state that he worked hard as a, you know, as a gubernatorial primary candidate, is the, the north and the eastern tier, I mean, in all those little towns. So he's known up there. He might, he might get some traction. I think one of the problems, though, is you know, once again, fundraising. You know, he ran. He was a clean elections candidate in the governor's race, which absolutely was definitely hurt him, considering all the big money other candidates were raising. Now he's got to hit the fundraising trail, and you need money for that district. You've got to run ads in the Phoenix and Tucson media markets. Phoenix is one of the most expensive media markets in the country. We haven't really seen any demonstrated fundraising ability. It's been a long time since he's had to, you know, urge people to write a check. You know, you've already got, you know, one of his opponents will already be uh, Gary Keeney, who very narrowly lost the primary last year. You know, he's a veteran guy. He's got some money. He can raise some money. You know, we might see some other folks get into the race, possibly Paul Babieu. Let's uh, talk about <laughs> Babieu. I think the, uh, a recent poll showed him leading Bennett, that poll done by Paul Babieu's Babieu. uh, group. So we <laughs> yeah. throw that in there. But, I mean, if he gets in, all bets off? Yeah, he's got a national presence. He's a Fox News talking. Uh, they, they like to pull him on, talk about immigration. So he's got some national presence. He's got some baggage, as we all know from a few years ago, and the, the selfie pictures that, that became published. So that, that may be an issue. But he does, he, he's very smart. He's very uh, outgoing, and people like, I mean, they have a connection with him. So he may, this may be an interesting race. Now, the question is, how do we get, you know, how, who do you find in the Democratic Party? You got Barb McGuire, who's a senator from Kearney. Um, I don't know if she's got three or four million dollars that she can raise to, to win that race. Um, Kratha Miranda considering getting in, but I haven't heard much since she uh, said that I might think about it. Uh, Carlisle Begay, a state senator from up in the Navajo Nation, told me this week, I'm not interested, I'm staying in the Senate, this is what I'm doing. So, you know, who else could get in? Well, and we, we, that's a good point because this is a Democratic seat. So far, yeah, I remember Kirkpatrick has held on to this, you know, won this seat the last couple of years by the skin of her teeth. You know, two elections in a row, everyone figured she was done for, and she came back and surprised everyone on election day. Are the Democrats going to be able to find someone else who can replicate that? You know, it's hard to say right now. There's no big names really looking at the race, but uh, Casey Clark, who I believe is the uh, sheriff of uh, Apache County, for the Navajo. Navajo, we've heard a couple of names, but no real big names. No one who I don't think anyone has, has uh, you know, really turned their head and said, "Wow, you know, what a good candidate." But like last time, it's the national money that's going to really matter. If if you get a legitimate candidate, a viable candidate, and they start getting traction, and the national parties are going to come in. This is one of only 40 seats in the mm -hmm. country that can go either way out of 400 and some odd. So it's one of a few. And there's going to be a battle over it. Just it's too early to really yeah. see how it's going to coalesce. I've, I've heard um, former Flagstaff Mayor Sarah Pressler uh, might be looking at it um, on the Democratic side as well. So she's got a Flagstaff's in the district. It's the it's the Democratic heart of the, of that district. Um, but you know, she's she's said nothing yet publicly. Okay, uh, a judge has ruled uh, that Diane Douglas uh, cannot hire and fire. Board of Education staff, Diane Douglas is the superintendent of public instruction. She can't hire or fire Board of Education staff. Judge has ruled this. Diane Douglas apparently well, today said, oh, yes, I can. Yeah, well, what the judge, the judge simply dismissed this lawsuit. You know, Douglas sued, basically saying she wanted the judge to say, you know, I have authority over these people, and you know, and I can tell you, you know, who to hire and who to fire and where you can have your offices. The judge, basically, the judge said you know, she felt like you know, this authority rests with the board, but said you know, this is an issue, there's really no issue here for me to decide. I'm just going to dismiss the case. Now, what we've seen today that uh, Mary Jo's colleague reported is that uh, she put out a you know, letter to the State Board of Ed saying, you know, those two uh, vacant spots you're trying to hire for, I have, I have control of that now. So maybe that's the next lawsuit. <laughs>
What's going on here? I mean, is, is she just kind of all, what's well, happening? Well, I mean, you know, Superintendent Douglas, uh, her, her suit didn't get anywhere with the judge in the lower court. Um, her attorney's already indicated they're going to appeal that. She obviously, with today's action, you know, feels very strongly that she is the person who has the authority over the staffers for the Board of Education and says, you know, she's trying to stop the hiring process. I don't know what, what this is going to lead to, if we're going to have another, you know, fight or another uh, lawsuit over this, but she's going to stop this hiring process, does not want these people coming on until she until she finds somebody that she wants to hire and that she can control. <laughs> uh, I, f um, I think the board is going to ignore that pretty much. They're going to, Christine Thompson, who's the board executive director right now, her deputy uh, is leaving at the end of this month and another staffer is leaving. Um, Thompson said a couple weeks ago, I'm going to hire Christina's, uh, the Sabrina's replacement. So that's, as far as the executive director is concerned, she's going to hire who she wants to hire. Uh, I can't see Diane Douglas going back to the same judge in the same court and saying, stop, wouldn't they just pull well, her and, and go away? Well, the judge dismissed the case, but the judge did say that the Board of Education seems to have the power to hire and fire, not her. Yeah, and so the, and, and the power they, to hire, which, you know, in, you know And that Douglas the is just one well. member of the board. Sure. Now, the state statute says, you know, the Board of Education, you know, employ its employees, you know, quote, at the recommendation of the superintendent. But it's hard to say what that really means. Does it mean that the superintendent has veto power, which certainly seems to be what Superintendent Douglas feels? Or does it mean you have to consult? Is it kind of like when the, the redistricting commission has to, quote, consider the recommendations yeah. of the legislature? Is just kind of a pro forma thing? This might just keep rattling on until we get back into the legislature and somebody once again runs a bill, you know, and I don't even know why the one last session fell apart, but th there was an attempt to clarify right. that, make it very yeah. crystal clear, you know, who has authority over what. But this issue begs for a solution, and somebody better bring a bill forward to mm -hmm. resolve this. We have a lot of legal fees being paid otherwise. Yeah, the uh, bill last year died, and you know, Douglas and Ducey both supported this, but it seemed like no one really put forth much yeah, effort just, in trying to get well, it passed. It just kind of collapsed right. under its own weight. Well, what happened with that bill? It passed the Senate with only one no vote. It came over to the House, and there was a whole group in the House, Kelly Townsend led uh, group, that remembered what had happened in Wyoming a couple of years ago where the governor tried to throw out the superintendent of public education. This and, and they drummed that up into, and that's a bad phrase, they, they used that as an example of what they didn't want to see happen in Arizona. They did not want to see the superintendent of public instruction stripped of her power. And so they blocked it. It, it went down 37 to 20 in a vote and mm. they brought it back for reconsideration and never even put it up. All right, before we go, we have to talk about uh, the Dreamers, uh, this licenses for Dreamers back in court, back at the Ninth Circuit here. Uh, Arizona wants this ban reinstated, and it sounded like the judges, they were kind of tough on both sides, but it sounded like they were pretty tough on, uh, on the Arizona side. And one judge even said, it was, so what are we talking about here, racism? Yes, that's Harry Pregerson. He's one of the oldest members of the Ninth Circuit. He's 91 years old and sharp as a tack from what I was watching. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, they did not, uh, you know, he turned to the lawyer for the state and says, you know, this is all about, you know, this sure does appear to be about racism. Um, let's talk about it. And the, you know, the, the state's lawyer said, no, no, let's, I wish he hadn't said that judge and tried to move on. But he pressed him on it. Um, and then another judge said, well, the argument that the state is putting on is that the director of the Department of Transportation, Hal Akowski, who's now been replaced, um, is, is one who, who made the decision um, to not give driver's licenses. And it, and it wasn't the governor. So it wasn't a political issue. And, and the argument is that the, the director of Department of Transportation should be given leeway to, uh, to interpret the law. Um, well, that lasted about 30 seconds until the, Judge Bergen held up the declaration from Jan Brewer, which told everybody, don't give them driver's licenses. Right. And so it, it looks pretty bad for the state. Uh, what do you think here, Jeremy? I mean, uh, it, based on what they were saying at the hearing, it sounds like this was, did not go well for the state at all. I'm not sure how they get past uh, the district court ruling from uh, Judge Campbell saying, well, you already give driver's licenses to some people that have this document. Why? If you're going to do that, why are you going to deny it to these others? You know, they, they say, well, it's because, you know, we believe President Obama acted illegally or unconstitutionally, but they're not asking the judges to rule on that. They're just saying, because we think this, we should be able to do this. Right. And so far, the judges haven't bought that. All right, we'll see how the ninth uh, rules on that. Hey, great conversation. Thank you so much. We appreciate it.
Monday on Arizona Horizon, forecasters are already warning of an especially strong El Nino weather pattern for this winter, and we'll hear about a plan to help reduce the price of algae-based biofuels. Those stories and more Monday on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, we'll update the state's tourism numbers. Wednesday, the latest on the Pluto flyby with physicist Lawrence Krauss. Thursday, State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt explains his opposition to the governor's plan to help fund education. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.